and welcome to Facing Finals. My name is Patty Bruner and I'm a facilitator here at Patriarch House and also of Truth of the Spirit. And we provide spiritual formation for Catholic adults through speakers and use of podcasts on the internet to share the good news throughout the world. And so at this time of the year, uh, the church gives us a little tap on the shoulder uh, to give us a wake-up call to remind us that this world, as we know it, is going to pass away. And uh, at Mass recently, we heard the message to get ready uh, to look towards final judgment. So uh, if you're like me, you know, we think we're going to live forever, <laughs> and the church is saying, uh-uh, unless you think about eternal life, that's the forever we're going to live in. We're not going to live forever in this life, in this world. And so, and so we think about making a list. At my age, uh, I make a list to help me remember what to do. And so a bucket list, a bucket list is a list of things that you want or need to do to accomplish before you pass from this world to the next. So facing finals is your opportunity to take some time out of your day to contemplate just what those things might be. So we've gathered today because God created us for eternity with him. And he placed us within time to prepare for that. He gave each of us a vocation uh, to know, love, and serve him in this life as we prepare to be with him forever in eternity, forever in the next. But sometimes we get bound up by time. And our habits and our routines allow us to forget that this world is quickly passing away for us. So let me read you something from Scripture. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you. Okay, so this is 2 Peter chapter 3. So he says, I'm writing you, and, and through these letters, by way of a reminder, I'm trying to stir up a sincere disposition. Okay, so that's what we're doing. We're going to stir up today a sincere disposition to face finals. But he goes on to say, but don't ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand. And a thousand years is like one day. Now, then the, the scripture continues, the Lord does not delay his promise, as some regard delay, but he is patient with you, not wishing that any of you should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar, and the elements will be dissolved by fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found out. So Peter then, he exhorts us to be prepared. So as we recall that one day is like a thousand to the Lord, it's also true that a thousand is like one day. As we face our final days, consider that today may be your last day. If yesterday had been your last day, you wouldn't be here today. But if you look back at yesterday, what would you have done differently if you had known that yesterday was your last day? You may not have a tomorrow. But this, this is the day the Lord has made. So in the winter of your life, you know, the winter when the snow goes on the, the peaks here, you know, it may be difficult to complete all the tasks that you want to do. A, a good friend, Frances Ryan, first told me years ago, she says, don't wait. Don't wait to do the things that you want to do because 
when you get older, you don't feel like doing them anymore. And so what we need to do is, is take up the challenges and the chores and see how our own preparation for facing finals can then benefit others. And the steps we have to take for, face, for our final days are similar for everyone. Uh, and it's not to worry. We're not doing this to have you to worry, but to prepare. Prepare. You know, a student uh, that um, is in school, they, they prepare for finals, don't they? When they're in the classroom, if y'all remember being in the classroom and, and you remember all the material and you take notes and you study and you prepare for those finals. And, and the reason is, is because uh, you have to think about those important things that might be on that final test. And so you know how to spend your time getting ready. You know what's important. And you have an eye on passing the test or, or maybe even receiving a high mark on that as a goal. Well, the, uh, in, in our final times, uh, in our final time of our life, it's important to, re, you know, to realize that the difference between a passing grade and a failing grade affects you for all eternity. So, how many of y'all want to pass? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen, brothers and sisters. <laughs> so, review your life and, and remember the times that you failed to love God and others and, and have you repented? Have you been forgiven? Or to, to follow the school analogy, did you miss class on the day that the makeup work was provided? You know, did, did you ignore the sacrament of reconciliation? Because that's our makeup day. That's when we get to get everything right and really be ready for that final test. Reconciliation, if you ignore it, it's like ignoring medical treatment. You know, those of us at this age, we're... We, we look at medical treatment as a way to help us to, have a, 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 to be healthy, to enjoy our life. Well, reconciliation does that for us too, and it prepares us not to just be a happy now, but happy forever. So as we close the liturgical year, uh, we had Christ the King this weekend, and, and that helps us to see that, that eternity grows to a close. Each year we have the liturgical calendar and we celebrate Christ the King as the end of the year that's facing finals with Christ, seeing Christ the King. And so uh, we're, we're starting this next week with Advent and we can look at our lives like that, you know, that we finish, we finish a year, we finish a life and then we have the Advent and Christmas to look forward to. We, you know, we have a new, a different season, the eternal season to look towards. So um, many of us are heading into the senior moments of our lives. And yet, as one season ends, the new one's upon us before you know it. Time, time's picked up speed, hasn't it, for us? There's not as much time as we think anymore. And it may be that the time is today, and that's it. So remember, this is the day the Lord has made. Do you have a bucket list? Do you have a list of things that you, you, you really need to, to get done? Or if you already have the list, do you need to refresh that list? So after our speaker, uh, we're going to spend a little time and some reflection time on working on our bucket list today. We're not going to put it off to tomorrow. We're going to do a little work on it today. So our speaker today is Deacon John Pate. He is a deacon for the Diocese of Little Rock. He serves a St. Vincent de Paul Parish in Rogers, Arkansas. And Deacon John Pate was ordained a deacon on December 14, 2002. And he moved to Rogers in the middle of studying to become a deacon. And so he chose to come to this area uh, to be here to serve us after he was ordained. And recently he has served as a, a hospice chaplain. So he has a tremendous amount of experience to share with us. He's married to Sandra Pate, and he's led a fascinating life, including being a drummer in Memphis, 
and his drum set is in the Rock and Roll Museum in Newport, Arkansas. So he recently published his story, Blessed, uh, the name of it is Blessed from Preacher's Kid to Catholic Deacon. We're glad that he's with us and uh, please help me welcome uh, Deacon John Pate. Shortly after I uh, became ordained deacon, uh, most deacons uh, find an apostolate or an area to concentrate their ministry on. And uh, I wanted to uh, head, uh, be in the hospital and hospice ministry. So shortly after I became ordained, I got into uh, uh, chaplain school. So after I graduated, I actually became board certified as a clinical chaplain and also as a pastoral counselor. And so uh, I'm board certified in those areas and, and went to work for Circle of Life, which is was a blessing for me because that's the best chaplain job in Northwest Arkansas is at Circle of Life. Everybody, everybody that's in the chaplain business and, and there's probably 30 or 40 and I, I know most of them uh, would love to work for Circle of Life. <laughs> because hospice work is such delicate work that uh, they don't have volunteer chaplains. You have to have had the training to do that kind of work. So I, I worked for in Circle of Life as a full-time paid employee for 10 years. And about a year ago, I went from full-time to part-time. And from that time, I've had over 2,000 patients that I personally have walked with through that last part of their journey. And uh, everyone's unique in some way. Uh, one of the things that uh, we were talking about before we got here about was this gonna be a financial talk. <laughs> no, I, 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 have honestly, I have honestly never had a conversation with a person on hospice about how much money they had or how much money they made or anything about money. At the end of life, it's a non-issue. It's a non-issue. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> what do we uh, leave behind? And I'll, I'll try to be brief on all these, and if you have questions, jot them down. If we have time, I'll take some questions, Patty. But uh, some of these stories can go on and on. It's hard to make a long story short, at least for me. But, um, <clears throat> uh, one of the things that when I would go in and, and uh, speak to a patient, I would, you know, it's my, you know, I was, I had a focus on the spiritual care. So I'm trying to work to that subject, you know, like, how are you, how are you doing, where are you from, you know, well, I'm from Memphis, well, I'm from Memphis, too. you know, trying to relate a little bit and get connected. And then I would say, if, do you have any religious affiliation? And of course, it's, all kind, you know, A to Z, or yes I do, or no I didn't, or I went to the church when I was a little boy, but it hadn't been since, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, anyway, if they say they're Catholic, great. Uh, I would say, um, have you received the anointing of the sick? And uh, if yes, great. If not, if not, then would you like to receive the anointing of the sick? And 99% uh, of the time it was yes, yes, I, I do want that. So I, I would, I'm in contact with all the different priests and all the parishes up in Northwest Arkansas, and they all work wonderfully. They all work wonderfully. You call the priest about any of these parishes and say, I've got a person here in, in hospice, the end of life, and they want the anointing of the sick. They're happy to respond. They're happy to respond. So that's uh, in the anointing of the sick, um, if you're not familiar with it, the priest comes out and it's a rite. He, he says some prayers, you know, he lays hands on them, says some prayers. He anoints them with oil. Uh, he, if they're able to talk and uh, are livid, you know, or uh, aware enough, would you like to give a confession uh, or not, you know? And uh, if, uh, you know, uh, if he brings Vaticum, which is the Eucharist, which is, is, is spiritual nourishment for the journey, and if they're able to, you know, to swallow it, if they, if it's hard for them to swallow, we'll break off just a tiny piece and put it on their tongue, and then have a, a little sip of water, 
you know, so that uh, they can have the Eucharist. So the, for, for Catholic patients, uh, that's the first thing and a great source of comfort for those that receive the anointing of the sick and for the family as well to know that that has occurred. And my, you know, as we all get to that point, uh, if I'm not able to talk, yes, I want all that. <laughs> you can say, I remember he said that once, because it's a beautiful thing, and I, I will, will stay in there with the priest, and, and we would all leave if they wanted to give confession, so it's just the priest and the person there. Memories. Uh, one of the things we leave behind is good memories. We can also leave behind bad memories. But... Uh, Focus on the good memories. Um, I, let's I try to draw the conversation into that, like into the good memories, and and you know good thoughts. And I remember I was I was had a, a man, and any names I use are fictitious because by, for medical privacy, I can't say Patty. I may call her Jane in this story, but you wouldn't know who it was, you know, kind of thing. But I had this man that that had a, a farm that was upstream from War Eagle. He had a couple hundred acres up there. And we were sitting out on his front porch and talking about good memories. And he had born, that was, been had landed been in his family since he was a little boy. Or, and uh, uh, asked him, uh, you know, what uh, what he thought about heaven. You know, what, and he, I said, he said, well, you know, it's gonna be really, really good. He, I said, what do you think it'd be like? And he was looking out over that pastoral setting. He says, probably going to look like this right here. You know? So good memories, good thoughts. Uh, we, we leave that behind. Um, there was a man, when I, back when I was living in Little Rock, that we, we had, Sandra and I had a home Bible study for 10 years. It met twice every other week in, a, in our home. And uh, we had a, a man in there that... Uh, had hence moved, we were living in Little Rock, he had moved to, to Fayetteville. And I uh, had kind of lost contact with him. And he called me one day, I was at work in Little Rock, and said, uh, uh, you know, he was in the VA hospital. He said he had terminal colon cancer, I think it was, and uh, that he wanted to see, wonder if I'd come visit him one more time, because he knew he didn't have much time left. And, so I said, sure, sure. His name was Glenn. So I uh, I went up there to drove from Little Rock to Fayetteville, and and he wanted to talk about all the good times we had in the community group. You know, we actually went camping once together, and uh, you know we did all kind of fun things for the kids. You know, around particularly around Christmas, the the people had had families, and and he remembered the the good times and the good memories. And then I, I asked him, I said, you know, as he was reflecting back on his life, I said, Glenn, what is, what's it all about? What's life all about? And his, he said, well, he was very thoughtful. He said, well, there's God and there's Jesus and um, everything else is a waste of time. And so we had a, a, a good conversation and I left. And that was the last time I ever saw him because he died a couple of days later. Uh, but but those good memories are important. Uh, even when I do wake services and for hospice, I've done over a hundred funerals just for hospice, not counting what I've you know few done here for the church because uh, usually those are masses and and I don't do those. But I you know in, in the night before when you have a wake service. Uh, always have a time for people to share good memories, and some share funny stories. I remember one one younger brother, his older brother was had died, and and the younger brother shared fishing stories and that, how much time they how what a good time they had fishing and funny things, and everybody just laughed and laughed. You know, funny good stories and good memories are re really important. Uh, so we, that's something we can leave behind. Uh, forgiveness. Uh, and I saw just in this, you're going to talk about that a little bit. But forgiveness is very important, you know. Uh, each, always give the patient the opportunity to talk about that subject, to what they feel about it and, and what um, their thoughts are. And if there's any unforgiveness there. 
had a, a time when, and, and I'm just taking these random stories to maybe illustrate a point here, but I had this time that, that I, uh, you know, we'd get new patients on our computer that you go visit this person, and, and they, you get a face sheet with the address and phone number you call and so forth. And I went out to this place, and it was a 95-year-old man in a little little tiny frail wife had they'd been married for 70 years and uh and she he was laying there in the bed in the living room they moved the hospital bed into the living room and uh so uh you know there he is and so i was was kind of hard he was kind of gruff and hard to engage in conversation but uh i finally got him to ask him if he had church affiliation he said no i said um did you go to as a little boy did you go to church did you go to your grandmother or anything he said well i'll tell you this i'll tell you my experience he said when i was 15 years old he said i was walking down the street and this pastor came out and started accusing me of something that i didn't do and he said i told him i i didn't you know he said he wouldn't he just kept he just kept on me about it he said, I said at that moment, I'm never going back in another church. And he said, and I haven't. That was 80 years ago. And so I thought, boy, uh, what, uh, and so I, I tried, I got on the subject of forgiveness. And I, I don't even remember the dialogue, but we talked about it. We talked about the importance of forgiveness and and that, that this was, you know, uh, by forgiving someone that didn't condone the bad thing they did to you. You know, you, you just don't want this for unforgiveness to be a cancer on yourself. And, and but uh, finally, um, I s asked him, I said, would you like for me to pray for forgiveness? No, I said, w would you like to pray for forgiveness? And he said, uh, he said, thought a minute he said well you know really I don't know how to pray I, I said well would you like me to pray for you? he said yeah yeah I would like you to and so I prayed for everything I could possibly think of and I said I told him beforehand I said if if uh, what I pray for is something you don't believe you you know just nod your head no or say no and a no is a no but um you know, if you do agree, you can say amen or I agree or just not. Just. So I prayed for everything in the world and, and uh, particularly forgiveness for this man and for what he had done and that, that the patient could give this forgiveness to him. And uh, after it was over, I looked up at him and he said, amen. <laughs> And so we talked a little bit, and I went to the door, and this little wife let me out. And she looked in my eyes and said, he's held on to that a long time. <laughs> she was so relieved. And I go back to the office, and I'm thinking, you know, this was really good. Uh, and so I get on my computer, and I find a note on there that says that they had forgotten to tell me that that patient had declined chaplain visits. <laughs> so I went there by mistake. It wasn't a mistake. <laughs> but he died a couple of days later. I never saw him again. So, you know, sometimes forgiveness is done at the last minute, but it still counts this much. Um, Another thing we can leave, leave behind is prayer. Uh, when you're when you're on the last, and you, you can't do anything for yourself, you kind of let go of all control. People are used to make decisions and go places and do things, and now you've lost all that control. Uh, then uh, you can't pray. You can't pray. So prayer becomes extremely important. Um, I remember uh, when I first became a chaplain, I got a call from rural Madison County location that 
to come out and visit, and I walked out, uh, or drove out there, and I thought I was lost a couple of times. Finally, I found it, and uh, uh, drove up, and the patient's uh, son was what on the porch, Charlie, and he was waiting for me. And so when uh, when I walked up to the country house, walked up to, he shook my hand. He said, uh, "Mom, mom's not doing very good. Mom's not doing good." So he, they took me, the house was full of people, relatives and friends, and um, he took me back to the back room and everybody kind of followed me back there. Uh, they'd been waiting for me. And uh, so she was laying in the bed and uh, she was semi-conscious, but what, what it was taking all the energy she had to make the next breath. She just didn't have any energy to talk. But there was some, was some awareness there. And so, uh, you know, it, I'm thinking, what can I, what can I do here? You know, she she couldn't talk. I, the family was do something, you know. And so I said, uh, I asked the family, I said, would y'all like to say a prayer? They said, oh yes. They were glad, jumped at it because they were glad I initiated that. And so we we said a, a prayer for her and for forgiveness for her salvation. Just all, everything I could possibly think of was in the prayer. And at the end of the prayer, her, I was sitting in a chair beside her right there, and her daughter is a double bed, and her daughter was kind of sitting on the, the bed on the other side. And uh, at the end of that prayer, she took maybe three or four breaths, and then kind of a reflux when you're, when you're dying, your body relaxes, and there's a, kind of a, a, a whew, like, Maybe even like it's finally over, and and she and, and the daughter looked at her and, and said, "Mama's gone," you know, and that they left, went out of the room, started getting on phones and everything, calling, and I I was sitting was sitting there waiting for the hospice nurse to come out because I called her and said this person this patient has passed, and uh, I heard them saying, "Mama's gone," but the chaplain's here. And we had a prayer before she died. It was huge. It was huge. Uh, remember a, a, a guy that I had in a hospice home, Joe. And he was in, in the uh, motorcycle gang business, <laughs> I guess you'd call it. And uh, he was sitting in his bed, but, but you know, the nurses, in fact, when they sent me in the hospice nurses there on the floor said, Hey, you need to go in this room here that he's been, this been disruptive and he has a, uh, uh alcohol and, and drug background in their relationship problems in the family. And, uh, you know, like good luck chaplain. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, I went in and Joe was in the bed and all these people around talking and he was, had his shirt off and had all kinds of tattoos and some of them he did himself. I could tell that, uh, we weren't very good, but but I went over there, and, and when I walked over to the side of the bed, I said, I'm Chaplain John Pate here, and I just wanted to check on you, just bye bye bye, to see if you had any spiritual questions or concerns. Boy, that place got quiet. <laughs> quiet. He thought a little bit and thought a little bit, and I said, Is there anything that I could do for you, or, or anything? In, in, there's a girl sitting there on a little couch, and a young lady, and she said, I got a question. And so I went over and I said, I said uh, uh huh? And, and she talked real soft, so I asked her if I could sit down on the couch beside her to hear what she, she said, that's my dad, and he's not a religious person. And I said, well, would you like for me to uh, see if he wants me to, you know, be sure, see if he wants me to, say a prayer and she was like oh you can't if you want to so I went I said Joe would it be hard if I said a prayer for you and uh, he thought a minute and he thought a minute and he said well okay hmm. so uh, uh, the room I said well let's gather around uh, the room and hold hands as a symbol of unity because it Heard they had the relation problems there. So we all held hands, said a prayer. And at the end of the prayer, 
uh, I said amen. I looked at Joe. I said, Joe, did you agree with that prayer? And he paused and he paused and he says, yep. And the whole room erupted in applause. <laughs> and it surprised me and him. And, and he smiled and, you know, uh, so uh, that was the best thing, prayer. Uh, and he died, you know, maybe the next day. And they asked me, the family asked me to do his funeral. We had his funeral at the little park in West Fork. It was right there on the river. I don't know if y'all know where that is. But it was a funeral slash cookout. That's what they want. And it's a motorcycle group of his friends there and, and family. And we had a, a funeral there at, on, the, on the shore there and a cookout. And they, the, it seems like the whole atmosphere had changed from tension and stress to uh, acceptance and, and relaxation and, and, you know, community. So anyway, uh, also uh, important at the end of life is family. Uh, you know, uh, all the people that are dying want to see their family. And uh, I had a, a man up in, uh, <clears throat> up in the hospice home, uh, in actually the one in, in Bentonville, who was, the, you know, hospice patient in his end of life, and asking him what he would, what he wanted, what what his wishes were at this point. And he said, "I'd like to see my daughter again." Okay, I said, "Where where is she?" I said, "Well, she's in the women's unit at Newport, Arkansas Department of Correction." I said, "Oh," he said, "Yeah," and he said, "But I I'd like to see her before I died." Said so we we had um, we we you know didn't see eye to eye, and uh, she, she's led a, a pretty wild life. But I'd like to see her again. I thought, how am I going to pull this off? So I called the chaplain up at the Newport unit, and um, and told her, the lady chaplain, that what what the circumstances were. And she said she'd talk to the warden. Call me back. So she talked to the warden and called me back and said, well, you know, we might can work this out under certain circumstances. Said that, uh, and making a long story short here, said you, that she is picked up, that they would have, she'd have to have an escort, but there's uh, off-duty policemen in Newport that do that sort of thing, you know, for a fee. They'll do uh, escorts like this, patient, uh, prisoner escorts. And uh, said, you know, there's probably some guys over there that would be interested in helping. They would need to pick her up after the first count of the morning. They count them all day long, you know, <laughs> make sure they got everybody's there. Mm -hmm. And have her back by the, the last count, you know. And uh, could do that. So anyway, pull that off, and, and she, she uh, actually was a level three sex offender. She was. A level four is worst case, which means dangerous, you know. Level three is pretty bad. And so they had to really stretch to let her go. If somebody had a lesser charge, it would have been an easier thought. But um, she came, I met the, the, the uh, talked to the, the escort and all that. And when he wrote, you know, came up there, I went out to the truck. He had her in a pickup truck and he had her shackled. And she was handcuffed to the, the seat. <coughs> and uh, so we had worked out where the family would bring some blue jeans and t-shirts and tennis shoes and you know so she could she was in her whites her prison whites and so we had these nurses that when she got in the door went in the restroom with her and changed changed clothes to street clothes went back and uh, visited with her dad and <coughs> You know, I was just observing, kind of from a distance, trying not to be obvious at all. I, I did need to be in visual contact the whole time. And they had a really good visit. They made amends. They both said they were sorry for the past. And it was just a really good time. 
Uh, and then when it got time for her to leave, all that in reverse, you know. But he he uh, he he died a few days later. But he died at peace. He died, at peace. you know, to to have reconciliation within a family from estrangements and for hard feelings at the end of life is extremely important. It's important any time, but it gets, it gets more important at that point. Uh, also, um, when, you're, when I'm questioning a patient, I ask, um, but uh, you ask if they have a church affiliation, yeah, I'm go to the First Baptist. Well, are they aware of your, your being out here? No, would you like me to call and tell them yes? Uh, or, you know, kind of go through that line of questioning. But every now and then you come into someone that has no church affiliation, no past history with any church, no anything. And one such uh, a person was a man named Ray. And he, he was called out to, to, he was in his 80s, and called out by his, uh, you know, came on our program. And when he came on our program, it was on my list to go see, so I called up his wife and daughter, told him I was coming out. And so when I drove up, the daughter was waiting in the car for, for me. And she said that he's, uh, said we got him up in his wheelchair and he hadn't been in his wheelchair for weeks. But we, we got him at, in the kitchen table. Uh, you know, we were all in there. Uh, other family members were around. And uh, he's, he's, he's willing to meet with you. But, but he has no, he has no uh, religious background or interest. I said, okay. So um, I went in and, and talked to him a little bit. Could tell that he even just minor movements were painful for him, and he was probably on severe or extreme pain medicine, which you know. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> I told him we talked about God and Jesus and heaven, and and um, you know he he was, was interested in that. He was interested in that. And um, so I, 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 you know, just to be sure, I said, you know, when you were a little boy, did you, were you ever baptized? Or he said, no. It's a baby. He said, no, I'm never baptized. I said, well, would you like to be baptized? And he said, yeah, I think I would. And his wife said, what did he say? <laughs> she was kind of hard of hearing. And the daughter said, he wants to be baptized. And she was like, I cannot believe this. I said, okay. I said, well, let, let me do this. I didn't have anything with me. I said, it was like a 1030 appointment. I said, I'll go home and get me, get some things, come back and be here, back here about 130. He said, fine. And so uh, I came back and I had a little baptismal font that I have in my home chapel that I brought and a, you know, a linen, piece of linen to set that on and uh, some uh, water, uh, had some water, um, and uh, also I had some Jordan River water. But when we were in Israel, my wife got a whole liter of Jordan River water, and when I would do baptism, I'd put, I'd put a little few drops of that Jordan River water in there, uh, and so uh, I was ready to go. And so uh, I baptized him. I baptized him right there. He was. He was, in fact, he was, they had put him back in bed, and it was, he had skin tears, and to, to try to immerse him would have been, would, that would have killed him, you know. So, it, a, a baptism by sprinkling. But here, here's a person that had denied that his whole life, but now at the point of death, he, he's, and, and another, uh, a person uh, that, um, I'm skipping through some of these because we don't have time. How much time do I have left? Am I about done? Okay. Well, I, I was uh, had a was going to Little Rock. Uh, a, a, actually, a, a deacon had died, and it was going to have a, a service in Benton, and uh, I was going to go down there. And, the, um, and this was like Thursday, and I needed to leave that night and go down for a Friday funeral. And so I was trying to cover all my patients that I normally cover in five days and four days. And so I was rushing around, rushing around, 
and the, the nurse calls me and says, there's a, a man up here at Eureka Springs in a nursing home that um, the, they want, the family wants you to come up today. And I'm thinking, you know, that's 50 miles up there and 50 miles back, that's a 100 mile round trip and I'm already late and I'm, you know, and I'm, but, you know, the call of the chaplain is, I'll be right there. So I said, I'll get, get right on that. And so I was, didn't even think to look at my gas tank, but I was oh. racing up through there. But when I, I was way back up in the boondocks up there, and I looked down, it was only empty, and it, everything said empty, and I thought, man, I'm not going to make this. And it, those, so, those roads out through there have such small shoulders and a big ditch, most of them, that you can't pull off the road. So, if so you only get partially off the road, and somebody's come around that corner, you know, accident. So I was thinking, well, should I pull up in one of these driveways and call AAA? But, you know, it'd take them hours to get here and to even find it. But anyway, I made it to that little um, filling station feed store in Clifty. <laughs> and uh, thank goodness I got some gas there, uh, but I did make it. I thought that was my first miracle. Uh, <laughs> and then I get to the room, and uh, the, the lighting's not good in there. The, the, there's a heaviness of dread uh, in there. The hospice nurse was there, and uh, the wife and daughter and, and some others. And uh, so uh, they said, um, uh, you know, Stephen was the patient, and he was just almost, just hardly, barely hanging on. And But she had kind of uh, had talked to him, and she said that... Um, uh, that he wanted to be baptized before he died. So I, I go to the the, the lady at the and I, and I hadn't didn't have my Bible with me. Uh, I just kind of rushed up there unprepared, really. So I found a, a went to the, the the social lady up there, social worker lady up there, and got a a, a, a Bible. I asked, asked her if she had any Bibles. She says, Yeah, we have these Gideon Bibles. And so I said, Well, give me one of those. And um, and so uh, we had a, a uh, baptismal service right there. And, and uh, at the end of it, the, the daughter just kind of grabbed her mother and they both just started crying profusely. Uh, and such, the atmosphere had changed from dread and doom to joy and excitement that, that we got this done. And I left and, and went on to Little Rock and I checked my voicemail and the nurse uh, said that, that he had died shortly after I left. But the family felt like that he had hung on until that was done. That was their feeling that that had happened. So what, what can, those are things we can leave behind. We can leave behind uh, our relationship, or, or the good memories, uh, uh, prayer, uh, family, uh, our salvation, uh, our relation, our spiritual, uh, our spiritual uh, beliefs, we leave all those behind. Uh, so, you know, when you look at it, when we talk about bucket lists, uh, about a spiritual bucket list, I'm, I think in terms of your life story is uh, not, you don't have a life story and then a spiritual life story. Your life story is your testimony. You don't have a Christian testimony and then a life story. Your life story is, is your testimony. It's all one thing. It's all one thing. So it's important that the way we live our lives uh, is, is how, how we'll be remembered. We remember by how we live our lives. And, um, you know, I had a, a one grandfather that I knew a lot about and one that, that I, I didn't know as well. Uh, but I always wondered what his story was. You know, what, it, what he, he was a Christian man and what was, what was his thoughts and everything. I always wondered. So uh, it's important to write down your life story. It's important to write it down. And your life story is, is your testimony. It's 
your life and, and what God, how God has impacted your life. How God has been, what has he done in your life? And I decided, so um, I decided to do that. <laughs> I wrote this book here, Blessed, that Patty referred to. The, there's some of these in the bookstore there at St. Vincent de Paul. But anyway, it's just my life and what God has done for me. It's, it deals with people that have influenced my life for good. Uh, it deals with uh, just my family history, uh, the history of my family. And for special things that occurred, uh, funny stories, uh, uh, failures, you know, laments, and uh, also, you know, a few successes. So um, that's that's what um, I, I didn't want to just preach to y'all. You should do this without having done it myself. One of the things that we all should want to do is leave leave this world behind you a, a better place to help those that come after you. You particularly hope that you can can help your children, you know, to uh, in, encourage them in the right ways and help them to m maybe by the things you've learned, your wisdom you've, you've generated, help them uh, with their life. So um, that, that was one of the reasons I did that. Well, thank you. Let's, yeah. let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Deacon John. Uh, we're going to now, we're going to take some quiet time to contemplate uh, our bucket list. And so in your handout, uh, there's three sections. So if you'll, if you'll turn to page three, uh, the first one is about, the first one is, is listing your bucket list priorities. And you know, uh, so just uh, in a few minutes, I'm just going to explain everything, and then you're going to, uh, we're going to give you uh, about 15, 20 minutes to work on this. And you may not get it finished today, but at least you get a good start. So you know, um, it's just some of the things that he talked about about hospice. The things that you worry about at hospice is not the things that you might be worried about now. So. Um, uh, if you have a fear of dying, that means your soul is not prepared to die. And so think about that bucket list and, and, and uh, you know, ways that you can prepare for your final days, things that you really, you, you want to get done or you need to get done before that. And then the next page on page four, it's got list your friends and family. And, and Deacon talked about how those family relationships are so important. And so as you list their names, then consider what is undone or unsaid in your relationship with them that needs to be said or done to bring healing to those relationships. You know, and so, and, and then realize that as you heal with your family, that also heals your relationship with God. Just like he told the story about the, the unforgiveness and, and how that whenever he brought that daughter in, that there had been all of this unforgiveness against how he was then able to reconcile with God. And um, then our fifth one is just simplify. You know, as you focus on eternity, what busy things can you just, you know, those busyness uh, that impacts your daily life is not going to be infect, affecting your eternity unless you let them. And so, uh, you know, travel for travel's sake is not affecting your eternity. Now, traveling across the country to, to make up with a, a, someone that you've had a bit of rivalry with or a family member, that is important. So, um, you know, think about simplifying your dust bunnies you know that's okay dust bunnies are you know from ashes to ashes dust to dust that's that's the way we're going to be so um just let them accumulate longer times and and all the stuff the stuff that steals your time 
uh, to protect and maintain and to store? What can you simplify? So I'm going to give you about 20 minutes uh, to work on this. And like I said, it's okay if you don't finish. But we do ask you to, even, when you get finished, to just be quiet. So we're just going to have, you, and you, if you want to move around and go to another room during this time, that's fine. Uh, but just let's, let's take this 20 minutes of, of sacred silence to work on this. So this has been wonderful, hasn't it? Yes. Ethan does did a great job. And, um, and there's more. With the Holy Spirit, there's always more. And so many of the items that he touched upon, we're going to go in deeper in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Deacon Clarence Lease is our speaker next week. And he, again, he will talk a little bit more about what do you leave behind. And he... Uh, for a season uh, helped people plan their uh, final arrangements and so he's going to come at it uh, from that angle a little bit and we'll have more reflection time again to, and, and we'll keep working on our, our spiritual uh, bucket list and so um, uh, we're so glad that you're here and uh, I would like uh, Deacon if you could lead us in prayer and then and give us a blessing. Father, Dear Lord, I just thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I just bless them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Lord, This is the Padua Podcast Network, padawamedia.com.